Hello, everybody. Welcome back to For the Girls. We hope you've been surviving the off season. We have barely been surviving um, and hopefully enjoying all of the interviews we've been putting out for you. Stay tuned because we definitely still have some more awesome ones in store for you. For today, we're going to do a little bit of deep dive into money, revenue of all things F1. We'll talk about how it's made, who gets it, and specifically talking about the Concord Agreement and more and all the implications that that's having for news around Andretti and his bid to enter F1. Shout out to Greer Duckworth for the DM suggesting this topic and providing some very thought-provoking questions. So let's get into it. I'm Chessa. I'm Sarah. And I'm Tiggy. So let's start with some background. If you want more of a deep dive, listen to our Miami preview episode special topic that we did on money and sponsorships. I think that was episode 12. Uh, But F1 has some serious money, as we all know, and big prospects for the future. In 2021, revenue is up by 87%, over $2 billion U.S. currency, while F1's cumulative broadcast audience topped over $1.5 billion. So 2022, I think the numbers are looking even better, though we are still waiting on year-end earnings as of this recording But the Formula One administration makes all of this money through track fees, driver super licenses, commercial TV rights, which cost broadcasters massive amounts. Just as an example, ESPN officially signed a three-year deal to broadcast F1 in the U.S. through 2025. It costs them almost $90 million per year for the next three years. And if you need yet another reference for how much the sport has exploded, ESPN had been paying $5 million or has been paying $5 million per year since they signed the deal in 2018. So $5 million per year to $90 million per year is insane. That stat <laughs> gets me every time. And I will tell anyone that listens that stat because to me, it's just absolutely unbelievable. <laughs> it's crazy. So where does all this money go? A lot of it goes to the teams in the form of prize money and payouts. Every team gets about 36 million US dollars in prize money every year simply for being in the championship, just for showing up, which comes from kind of splitting up revenue like TV rights, circuit sponsorship. And then the teams also get payouts for where they finish in constructors, being the longest standing team, and various other bonuses that are laid out in the Concord Agreement, which we'll get into. So for example, Red Bull got $36 million in 2021 for being the first team to sign the Concord Agreement, and there's also been a lot of chatter about the payments that Ferrari gets as well. And then the team teams themselves also rely on sponsorships, big brand deals, and other things like merch to bring in additional money. So now that we talked about all the revenue and how things get made in F1, we need to talk about the Concord Agreement. So some background on what it is. It's basically a contract between the FIA and then the teams, which dictates the terms by which they'll compete in races, how the television revenues get split, and then most importantly, how the prize money is shared. All the teams need to be able to sign it in order to compete. And just a fun fact, it's called the Concord Agreement because the FIA talked about the first iteration of this contract back in 1981 at their offices, on the Place de la Concorde in Paris. Sorry, Tiggy, you're a French speaker. <laughs> no, so that's I did not beautiful. Say that right. <laughs> you, did, you did wonderfully. <laughs> in 2020, they updated this agreement. In August of that year, all 10 teams signed the new agreement. It had been set to expire, and this was Liberty Media's first agreement as the new F1 owners. It took quite a long time for the teams to sign the agreement with COVID and all the back and forth, making sure that every team was represented and happy with the stipulations. Uh, And this one will be in effect until 2025. So coupled with the budget cap and new regulations, the goal of the new agreement is really to solidify just the long-term sustainability of F1's future and also to reduce the kind of quote-unquote financial and on-track disparities amongst the teams. I think this is just part of the big push to make F1 more fair for all teams and to kind of avoid the rich getting richer phenomenon that has plagued the sport in the past. It's been referred to even as the uh, Robin Hood agreement, given that goal and that mission. So all good things, uh, sort of. We'll talk. We'll dive into to what it all means. It's funny that they're calling it the Robin Hood agreement when we're literally talking about like hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah, but... exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. The agreement and its terms are technically confidential, but we know a few key details and estimates. So 
As before, teams get paid in order of their constructor's standings with the top constructor getting the most, the last constructor getting the least. What's changed, though, is the delta between the teams. Before, the top team used to get 20% of the top with the bottom team only getting 4%, which is just an absolutely massive difference. Under the new agreement, to even things out a bit, the champion constructor receives 14% and the last place team receives 6%, which might not seem like a huge difference, but it definitely shrinks the gap a lot considering the sliding scale is less than 1% based on a constructor finishing position. And as for the total pot size, it's rumored to be over $2 billion, where the Robin Hood-esque reference really comes into play is that extra money is skimmed from the previous highest earning teams to bolster this pot. So out of that $2 billion, $800 million is written down to Liberty Media's expenses for running F1, and around $400 million is kept as a separate bonus pot, leaving about a $1 billion to be distributed to the teams based on their constructor standings. Another interesting thing about this or the most latest Concord agreement is that Ferrari maintained their special rights of having like veto rights for regulation discussions, and they also get their spatial their special payment for basically just being Ferrari, AKA like the most historical longstanding team. Although their special payment was decreased significantly, apparently went down from like 10 to 5%. It's obviously controversial to many teams, especially for teams like Mercedes, McLaren, Red Bull, and Williams who used to get special payments for being historic prestigious teams, but now they don't. So Ferrari is the only one. I think it's very, very interesting. And they, when they released their press release about the Concord Agreement, it was like kind of boasty. They were like, oh, yes, we got our, <laughs> we kept everything that we got. We're very happy. They often reference this to the fact that they are, quote, the only team to have taken part in every year of the F1 World Championship. So take that as you will. <laughs> <laughs> There's also another system for giving out bonus money because why not more? And that is for title winning teams and teams that have finished in the top three in the past decade. So this pot is made up a percentage of F1 revenue that's above a certain threshold. Apparently it's around 20% of what uh, F1 makes over 650 million. And the teams that are part of this currently are Ferrari, Mercedes, Red Bull, McLaren, Renault, and Williams. I had to like double check Williams. I was like, really? Top three in the past (laughs) 10 years? But it's true. (laughs) Um, The teams, they're awarded points for the number of constructors championships they've won over the past decade. And the more points you have, the more money you get. So let's dive into our thoughts on this whole agreement and structure. I think my take overall, it seems like a step in the right direction. And I think it will probably take many years to truly see the effects of the more even pay distribution, especially given the cost cap. It's not like all of that extra money that teams are at the back are getting can go towards car development, but it does probably help pad the bottom line more than anything. And over the long term, I do think it will help even the playing field and ideally bolster teams who have struggled financially and otherwise in the past. I'm very curious how long Ferrari is going to be able to continue to milk its historic status and wield its influence, even when they're not winning championships. I mean, they did have their best year in a while last year, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's kind of interesting that they still get to to get that extra money. I totally agree with Tiggy. I think it's it makes sense to some extent to have some of these historical payments and recognition of the value that certain teams have added over the years, but At the same time, at a certain point, I think we have to move on for that and maybe even do the reverse of actually helping and incentivizing teams who are new and teams who have really struggled to help even out the field a bit. Yeah, I actually, this is going to be maybe a controversial thing, but I think Ferrari probably deserves the money because if you ask someone randomly on the street, like, hey, do you know Formula One? And they like don't know anything about Formula One. And they're like, oh, do you know anything about fancy cars and like insane speed? Mostly everyone would say Ferrari. I think like the brand is very synonymous with it. And at least for now, they definitely bring a lot of that like historical pedigree. So for one, I'm on the side of the controversy here. I think Ferrari can do that. Not sure about the veto rights. I don't know why they get veto rights on the regulations, but alas. Um, Tiggy, I agree. I think this is a really good thing that's going on. Again, with the cost cap, I don't know how much of a difference it makes year to year, but it is interesting. I think it will help the smaller, newer, less well-performing, less funded teams work towards building up a like real franchise behind the team and like 
work on infrastructure that will hopefully help the team in the long run. So very interesting. So how does this all tie into a new team entering F1? As we all know, F1 has 10 teams. They have had 10 teams on the grid since 2016, where there were actually 11 teams before that, Manor Racing, MRT, which had originally started as Virgin Racing in 2010. And historically, there have been more than 10 teams on the grid at a time. But on January 2nd, the president of the FIA, Mohammed Ben Salayim, tweeted, I have asked my FIA team to look at launching an expressions of interest process for prospective new teams for the FIA F1 World Championship. So this is really the first time the FIA has so publicly discussed any intentions of adding an 11th team. It would be a big deal for people trying to get into F1, cough, cough, Andretti, which we will dive into, <laughs> since there would actually be a formalized application and negotiation process rather than kind of the Wild West that has been going on. I love that this he is- calls it the expressions of interest. Like next time I'm in the market for anything, I'm going to be like, anyone, I'm here for an expressions of interest if anyone can <laughs> bid, pitch me. <laughs> yes. It had previously been off the table because according to the existing Concord agreement, adding an 11th team would mean splitting the prize money pot 11 ways instead of 10, i.e. the teams are getting a smaller slice of the pie. There was a dilution clause written into the agreement for that purpose, and that requires any new entrant to the grid to pay $200 million to be split amongst the other teams in a way to sort of offset the resulting dilution of a bigger denominator and what the teams argue is money they would be losing out on for another team joining. What's interesting, though, is the $200 million, it's only like a one-time payment, but then you have to think about, okay – what's going to happen like the year every year after where the the pot is still diluted. We'll talk about that. So before we jump into the Andretti drama, I think we'll pause and get everyone back up to speed, Ari, what he's been doing in the past couple of years. So Michael Andretti, he's an American. He's really, really trying to get a team. He's from a famous American motorsport family. He owns a top IndyCar team as well as a bunch of other motorsport ventures. He's really been trying for many years, especially since October 21, to get his foot in the door at F1. He first tried to buy Sauber. That fell through. Then he applied to be the 11th team in February of 2022. There was like some funny pictures of him working the rounds at the Miami GP, like trying to talk to everyone who was important in American motorsport and F1 to try to make his case. He has openly agreed to paying that $200 million stipulation in the Concord Agreement, like the dilution clause, and he even announced the launch of his new $200 million racing facility that will open in 2025 to support, quote, future racing initiatives. So he seems very confident this is going to go through, maybe putting the cart ahead of the horse here, but um, (laughs) I appreciate the confidence, Michael. (laughs) So how is this all going for him? Uh, In the fall of 2022, Andretti was making the rounds, as Chesa was saying, saying he's made good progress. But at the same time, Domenicali had been saying that they don't need an 11th team in F1. In December, he made another statement that things are going very well and is proceeding as if he will have his team in 2024. They have slowly been building out their facilities, their team, contracts, that sort of thing. Um, so he's feeling confident. He's literally doing everything except for the fact that he can't actually join F1 yet. <laughs> we shall see. Uh, but the FIA president, he issued a statement expressing his surprise at the, quote, some adverse reaction towards the Andretti Cadillac Formula One project, saying, quote, we should be encouraging prospective F1 entries from global manufacturers like GM and thoroughbred racers like Andretti and others. Interest from teams in growth markets, cough, cough, America, adds diversity and broadens F1's appeal. So FIA is supposedly issuing a call for expressions of interest in the next few weeks, which is the first time, like we said, a process to evaluate new teams has been kicked off since 2013, so over a decade. I'm surprised that there's so much, like, the FIA president is so down for a new team He seems to be thinking about all the right things, but then all of the actual team principles, Domenicali, like that whole side of F1 doesn't want it. So it's interesting that even right up at the top, there seems to be a pretty decisive split on this issue. I don't know if it Well, I think it's like the people who stand to make more money versus the people who stand to lose more money. I think the FIA president is probably envisioning a bigger pie with GM and Andretti coming in, bringing all this American money into the market. And then the team principals are just thinking like, oh, I'm going to have to divide the denominator by 11 instead of 10. So 
they're they're all like looking out for their stakeholders, which makes sense. But we will talk about our thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I would love to hear Domeni Kali's take more on this because I think for him, he's probably just focused a lot on the sport and the pedigree and like he doesn't want to like dilute the franchise in that sense, less so the, the pot money. As you have probably seen, Andretti teamed up with GM, General Motors, and Cadillac, a huge American car manufacturer to bolster their credibility by bringing in such a big name. According to Andretti, it was actually the FIA president's idea to for him to partner with a big manufacturer to help their bid. Cadillac released a statement saying they'd be based in the U.S. with a sport facility in the U.K., They also referenced the races in Austin, Miami, and Las Vegas, talked about F1's growth in the U.S., and if they get chosen, they would like to have an American driver as soon as possible. The big issue here, we've been talking about it, it's that $200 million figure. People just don't think it's enough anymore to be satisfactory for the dilution clause. I think it only not only dilutes the prize money, but it also dilutes the commercial opportunities available to teams. People have compared the figure to the cost of getting new franchises in the U.S., in U.S. competitions like the MLS and the NHL. So in the MLS, it's $325 million, and then the NHL, it's $650 million. So $200 million seems meager next to that, and also considering all the growth of F1, they definitely want to reconsider it. Gunther put it well and said, quote, the dilution fund was set a few years ago when the value of Formula One was different. People have suggested that the dilution fund be readjusted to reflect the current market rate and the wild success of F1 in the past two years. And I I fully agree. What do we think? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. Um, Thanks again to Greer Duckworth for asking it. I think um, the exact question was, should the number in the Concord Agreement be a percent of market value instead of a static number? Apparently, the $200 million figure was based on the cost of buying an existing sort of middle to back of the pack team on the grid. And Williams sold for less than $200 million around that time. So it did seem reasonable. I think it's definitely fair to say that teams values have increased substantially over the past few years and that it makes sense to revisit that figure on a more regular basis to adjust for market changes. But to always be tied to the market value, I don't know if I fully agree with that. But I do think they should probably be a bit more flexible in what that what that entry fee is at any given time. Yeah, I think it's interesting too. Like the $200 million figure, I'm surprised that it only took into account the cost of like buying the team. I know it's harder to quantify all of those like non-quantitative things around like brand and and all the different things that you can bring into the team that aren't necessarily just the cost of the team. But I really do think they probably should reevaluate it and add in some other some other value. Yeah, I think also it's hard, really hard to quantify the amount of revenue that would be brought in by bringing in so much more interest and excitement for an American back team. And we've talked about, I don't know if necessarily it would cause a massive jump in, in American fandom, but I still think it could make enough of a difference that would help F1 as a whole. And that should be taken into consideration too. So do do you feel then like the $200 million may be enough considering that they're bringing in other revenue? Yeah, exactly. I think they could be adding a lot that $200 million should be enough to get them in the door. And then I think longer term, maybe they should have to share more of their revenue with other teams for a few years or there could be other solutions to it. But I think it, it should be enough to to kind of get them a foot in given I think they would add a lot yeah in terms of revenue in other ways it's interesting that you say that because people aka people who are set to lose the money stakeholders are demanding that Andretti like basically put forth a plan to prove that his team would be like a legit long-term and lucrative addition to the grid aka he just needs to show that the money that he'd be costing the other teams like not this year because they would get the the, pro, the prize pot money with the dilution clause, but like going forward, how much he'd be able to offset all of that for them. Toto made a comment, which I love, that if a team wants to be the 11th, they have to prove that they would be, quote, accretive to the overall value <laughs> of F1. And so Toto, the finance bro. Exactly. Toto, the businessman <laughs> strikes again. <laughs> and so while GM and Cadillac is widely recognized as a major manufacturer with a credible name, some people say that it could just be like a check the box badging exercise. And we don't really know how much GM would actually be involved besides having their name on the car. 
Yeah, there have also been some rumblings from Andretti supporters and new team proponents that the pushback is not just about the money, but sort of reflective of the gatekeeping attitudes that F1 and European yeah. teams have espoused in the past. It's it's hard to say for sure if that's at play, but it's definitely interesting to consider. It's not the first time in the sport we've heard about like the boys club, the European club, like all of that, I think probably does does have some play i think a lot of people have been saying like oh if gm and cadillac came in without andretti's name behind it and like maybe had a a british partner or something this story might be different which is interesting to think about yeah also it's interesting from zach brown he's in the other camp and said the andretti name has a huge history in formula one and in various forms of motorsport and i think would add a lot of value which is Interesting considering that he is the really kind of only prominent and senior American on the grid. So it kind of makes sense that he might have different thoughts on that kind of gatekeeping situation. And he and he owns a team with Andretti too. <laughs> yeah. So he, yeah, he did. He, he has some other things at stake as well. And apparently Alpine is also on board in some way or another since Renault is believed to be the manufacturer that would supply Andretti with an engine from 2026. What do we think? I I think I take a meritocratic stance on the whole situation. Like, if a team has enough promise, they can prove they have potential to be good enough to be fighting in the middle of the pack in its first few years, whatever it is. They come in with a major manufacturer. They can pay the entry fee. They promise to bring in new markets, more money for the sport. And I don't really get why not. I think... The idea that this sport just puts up ironclad barriers, even for a potential team that could likely be better than some of the ones on the grid right now. Like, sorry to say it, but (laughs) I think it's true. It just seems a little silly and short sighted and against the nature of growth and inclusion in the sport. And like, sure, it dilutes the pot at least maybe in the short term. And I get that these other teams are acting in the best interest of their own shareholders, but. Like, what if the new team can actually grow the pot so that the teams are getting more despite being a smaller fraction? I also just don't buy the argument that it materially affects the commercial opportunities for teams. Like, if I get, I could be wrong, but I'm guessing there are a lot more commercial opportunities than teams to go around right now. So, I don't know. Especially for American commercial opportunities. I think, like, yeah. a lot of people here in the States are dying to get involved and it's a little bit harder for them at the moment because there isn't technically like an American team. Like obviously Haas is, is an American team, but they don't really lean into that identity. And I think right now there is a big gaping void. And now we have an American driver coming in next year and like everything seems primed and ready to go for this like further explosion of F1 in the States. And I think the other teams might be like, to your point, Tiggy, a little bit short-sighted by not seeing the potential that there is like they are they're all going to the Vegas race they know that it's going to be like the biggest skeptical and Miami continues to get more and more insane so I do think there is a lot of opportunity here and we do need it would be nice to have an American team and to have Andretti but in general just the idea that an 11th team would always be bad is 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 ridiculous yeah I think it's also would be different if F1 had never in its history had more than 10 teams and if this was going to be some kind of crazy out-of-the-box idea but yeah if one in its history has often had more cars and teams and so I think given that it's not kind of as outlandish as an idea as I think some of the team principles kind of make it sound when they talk about it and also Andretti is a motorsport person like if, if this was just some billionaire from an unrelated industry coming in and being like I want an American team like maybe that would also be different. <laughs> I I don't know if I would use the same word as the president calling him thoroughbred, but I I really oh feel God. like <laughs> like he's got the pedigree. He clearly cares about motorsport, and he has he kind of like checks all the right boxes in my opinion. So I just yeah, it's very interesting to me that it's such a saga. I can't wait to report back and see what happens. Jumping into some other news, the drivers have been busy enjoying the offseason, and of course, Lewis is doing something extra cool. He did an, a trip to Antarctica with Sean White, Nina Dobrev, Zoe Deutsch, um, I think Jared Leto was there. <laughs> he also did a really great podcast interview. We posted the link to it with Jay Shetty. It's his first ever podcast interview. It was a really great episode 
he's just so inspiring. He talked a lot about his background, his challenges, his motivations, how he got into social justice work. It's a really great convo. Some other news this week, Bloomberg reported that the Saudi Arabian Sovereign Wealth Fund tried to buy F1 for $20 billion. Saudi has been trying to back several sports ventures over the years. You all may have heard of the recent controversy involving Live Golf, a competitor to the PGA Tour that Saudi Arabia started with just absolutely massive payouts to certain players. And it's really likely trying to distract from their abysmal human rights records and give them kind of legitimacy and a foothold on the international stage. But according to Bloomberg, Liberty Media is not interested in selling, but it was just insane, the valuation, because Liberty Media bought F1 for $4.6 billion in 2017. And then recently, Saudi Arabia was trying to multiple that. Interestingly, the FIA president, Mohammed bin Salam, also weighed in on this. He tweeted a few things, and he said that buyers need to, quote, apply common sense, consider the greater good of the sport, and come with a clear, sustainable plan, not just a lot of money. He said he was kind of worried about the valuation in the sense that he interpreted it, it seems, as just throwing a ton of money without necessarily kind of having that long-term vision for the sport. Some other news, we are also getting close to February, which means car launches before season testing in Bahrain at the end of the month. The first launch is going to be Red Bull, which is on February 3rd in New York. It's not totally clear yet whether they're launching their full car, which would be quite early, or just livery. And then Alpha Tauri is also launching in New York, which is very exciting. So the Red Bull organization definitely looking for an American angle here. Most of the other teams are launching back at their factories or at home bases and having other big events. So super exciting. And we're starting to hear some little trickles about the cars. Aston Martin said that the car is quite different per Alonzo's influences. So that'll be Interesting to see. (laughs) Williams also is potentially on the up and up. They hired James Vowles as their new principal, and he was a Mercedes head of strategy. So that is a huge hire for them. And Jamie Chadwick is continuing with their driver academy. So good news for them recently. The calendar has also now been cut down to 23 races this season, which is still a record, but it's down from the high of 24 because the race in China was canceled due to ongoing logistical problems posed by the COVID situation and getting into and out of the country. And it's not being replaced. So now the start of the season is super spread out. Thanks so much to everyone for joining. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We're so excited to have lots of fun content for you this month as we ramp up towards the start of the season.